morning, church. It's great having you with us this morning. Let's worship together. Sin perfect. 
I do want to ask you now to take your Bible and turn with me to the book of Colossians, chapter 1. I want to read verse 19 and 20. Some of you are saying, well, he's taking us back through the book of Colossians. No, we finished it. But there are two verses in chapter 1 that I want us to focus on today, on this Palm Sunday. And I've entitled this message, The Blood of His Cross. And when I read these verses, you'll understand why that I have the title, The Blood of His Cross. So let me read for you, if you'd allow me to do that, verse number 19 and verse number 20. Here's what Paul said to the church at Colossae. For it pleased the Father that in him, it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Let me pray with you for just one moment. Father, I want to thank you for this very special time today to share with the 1025 church family and the many friends uh, who are listening today. I want to ask now that you would help us to focus on these two verses of Scripture and that not only would we uh, exegete this passage, but then we would apply this passage so that we could be better servants for the Lord Jesus. I also pray today, Lord, that if there's one who is listening who has never received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that today they will understand the atonement that Jesus, the price that he paid for their sin. And I ask you today that you would save them even as I share this message and as I give the invitation at the end of this sermon. So Father, thank you for the blood of his cross. Take us there. Help us to put ourselves right there into that setting because upon the cross of Calvary, Jesus paid it all. The debt for all of our sin, he paid. And Lord, I thank you for that. Bless us now as we look at this passage. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, when I read this passage of Scripture earlier in the week, I began to ponder about the cross, and so I began to also ponder about the blood of his cross. And when I began to think about the cross, I began to think about how that the cross signifies that of the person of Jesus Christ, but it also signifies unto us uh, the Christian faith. As a matter of fact, across the globe, uh, it is the number one icon in all the world. You'll see more crosses than anything else. And so as I began to think about the cross and the blood of his cross, looking at this passage, I just began to think in my own little mind, how could I really bring that passage to life so that it would impact my life and it impact your life as well? Here we are one week out, one week from Easter Sunday, and I want to speak to you on the subject of the blood of his cross. Now, I began to do some study this week about the different types of cross. There were certainly the cross like would be uh, exemplified as I'm showing here where you would have the one stake that would go up to the top and then like the T uh, stake that would go across or the beams across on the other side. Some have had it just one pole and then across the pole there would be beams as well. I'm convinced that the cross that Jesus was crucified on was a cross that went straight up like a T and then across it, it would have the beam because you remember above his head was that sign that said King of the Jews or Rabbi of the Jews. And so I believe it was that of a T also because of the description. Now, some people believe that the cross would be anywhere from 9 to 12 feet tall. Some said even up to 15 to 18 feet tall and somewhere between 6 and 10 feet wide where the beam would run across. Some have said that the cross at the minimum would weigh at least 100 pounds. Now there are so many discrepancies, I don't want to argue that point, but all I want you to see is there was a cross that Jesus bore for your sin and for my 
sin. And upon that cross was the blood of the cross. But you know, there were several other points to the blood of the cross prior to Jesus getting to that place called Golgotha, the place of the skull, Calvary. I, I think in my mind, and I go back to the scripture, and I remember when Jesus was at the Garden of Gethsemane, and do you remember what the Bible says in his agonizing over the decision that he would make? And I believe agonizing over the fact of his own punishment and yet agonizing over the sin of the world. That the Bible tells us that in the Garden of Gethsemane that great drops uh, mixed with sweat of blood, mixed with sweat, dripped to the ground as he agonized. Remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, it was there that uh, Jesus was taken under arrest he was betrayed and taken under arrest at the Garden of Gethsemane. But I don't want you to lose sight. As, as the drops of blood, I believe, flowed from his brow, and as he cried out to the Father, and he said, Father, not my will be done, but your will be done, I'm convinced that his blood, even then, was being poured out for you and for me. I think about moving from the Garden of Gethsemane. that They arrested him. They took him to Caiaphas' home. And there, if you'll remember, the Bible says that he was punched in his face. In my little mind, I can see his lips bleeding. I can see his nose bleeding. I can see the beatings upon his face as the blood would flow. And then they ripped his garment and began to fight over his garment. And more than likely, probably causing blood as well. But think about the beatings and the scourging of the Lord Jesus Christ. Forty times save one. That means they would beat him and scourge him with a cat of nine tails 39 times. It was mixed with uh, glass and metal and stone. And, and as that cat of nine tails, that whip would come across his body. Uh, medical experts have said that often it would come all the way to the side and it would literally rip the flesh off of his body. And certainly blood flowed as the Savior was beaten. But think about how they planted a crown of thorns upon his head. And as they planted the crown of thorns upon his head, blood flowed. But when he began to carry that cross to Calvary, remember, of course, there was Simon who came and helped him. But the Bible says as Jesus was carrying the cross, he fell, and he fell to his knees. And I would imagine that his knees were bleeding. I would imagine that his hands were already bleeding, or his elbows as he fell to the ground that was more than likely as he took that trail was up a marble stone type setting and so it was very difficult the terrain was not very smooth and so as he fell he even began to bleed but have you ever thought about this the nails are the spikes that they drove in the Lord Jesus' hands uh, in my reading the minimum was a six inch nail that they placed in his hands and then in his feet. And you know that there was blood that flowed all the way down from his hands down his arms and there was blood that must have flowed down his body and from his feet and it fell on the ground but it was all over the cross. All over the cross. And then the Bible is quick to tell us that there was a Roman soldier there and the Bible says that the he thrust a spear into the side of the Lord Jesus and as he thrust the spear into the side of the Lord Jesus, the Bible says that blood and water flowed. So on the cross of Calvary, not only was there the Savior for all of mankind, but the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ shed on that cross. And that's why in this text, the Apostle Paul says, it was the blood of his cross his blood flowed for the sins of mankind. I mean, here's the sinless one. Never, ever committed sin. But he took all of your sin. He took all of my sin. He took all of the world's sin. And upon the cross of Calvary, Jesus Christ died for our sin. That's why I love to sing that old song. It says, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole? 
in nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious, his thigh flow. That makes it white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And yes, the blood covered the Christ, but the blood also covered his cross and the blood of his cross. The Apostle Paul writes, Jesus Christ died the most horrific death of that day. Not only hanging between heaven and hell, hanging between two thieves. And as the world looked on, many stood around, but even those who were close to him, the Bible says, stood afar off. Now this is very, very important. This text takes us to the blood of his cross. Now the average man, I am told, has about 12 pints of blood in his body. I am convinced that during those six hours as Jesus hung upon the cross, before he finally bowed his head and died, that more than likely, most of the blood in his body was gone. Just the struggle that he had to breathe. Just the cries that he cried out in which we'll look at in a few moments. All of that and the description that is given to us in the scripture of, of three illegal uh, judicial trials and three illegal religious trials and the beating and the spatting and, and, and the scourging and the crown of thorns and the nails and the, and the spear thrust into his side. All of that was enough for his blood to cover all our sin. And before I look at this text, the blood of his cross, I want to remind you of Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, where the Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. In the Old Testament, it was that of the animal sacrifice. Now in the New Testament, it is the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, who takes away the sins of the world. So upon the cross, Jesus, the blood of his cross. Now I want to share with you, out of these two verses, as I looked at this passage, I saw three things that the blood of his cross signifies. Three truths that the blood of his cross signifies. Number one, first of all, it signifies his Godhead. And you'll notice when he starts out in verse 19. Now, remember when we walked through the Colossians? Uh, remember how in this passage we talked about the preeminence of Jesus Christ? And we spent a little bit of time on Jesus and the cross. We talked actually about how that it was Jesus in creation, Jesus in the church, and Jesus on the cross. But now we find the blood of his cross signifies his Godhead, his Godhead. You say, what, is it, what do you mean? Well, look at verse 19. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. It pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. Now, as I look at that passage of Scripture, I see the Godhead in that passage. Remember in John chapter 10 when Jesus says, I and my Father are one. Remember in the book of Acts when Jesus said, hey, I'm going to leave, but I'm going to send uh, you, uh, but you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit shall come upon you in Acts 1.8. And then if you remember over in John chapter 16, he said, yes, I'm going to leave you, but I'm going to send another, the Comforter, the Paraclete, the Holy Spirit of God. Now notice how he states this. 
The Bible says, for it pleased the Father that in him, in Jesus, upon the cross of Calvary, all the fullness should dwell. I believe that's the fullness of the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit in Christ. Christ Jesus. You cannot separate them. It is always three in one, one in three. And so as he says into this passage, it pleased the Father. Remember what he cried out in the Garden of Gethsemane? He said, Father, not my will be done, but your will be done. And so here upon the cross of Calvary, the blood of his cross signifies unto us the Godhead, the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. In him all the fullness should dwell. The fullness of the Godhead. And so that's a good truth. There are many who do not believe in the Trinity. Uh, that's a really false uh, thing to say, or not a good thing, I should say, uh, that you do not believe in the Trinity. You say to me, well, explain it. I can't. There are mysteries in the Bible. But yet the Bible teaches us all the way from the book of Genesis through the book of the Revelation that there is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the Trinity. And upon the cross of Calvary, the blood of his cross signified unto us the fullness of the Godhead. That there you have God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now you'll see more of that as I walk through this text. But I want you to see first of all that the blood of his cross signifies unto us his Godhead. It says in him all the fullness should dwell. Secondly, it not only signifies his Godhead, but it also signifies his grace. That's right, his grace. Now notice the rest of the verse there, in verse 19 and verse 20, and you'll notice what he says there in verse number 20. He says, and by him to reconcile. Let's stop right there for a moment. And by him to reconcile. So when I see, first of all, how it signifies unto us the Godhead in all the fullness, and the Bible says, in him, I see the sovereign God, certainly, but now it says it signifies unto us his grace. It says, by him to reconcile. So I move from the Savior God to the Savior of the world, that he reconciles. As a matter of fact, here's what Jesus did. Jesus linked man to God. Here's what happens. Sin separates man from God. But there has to be a bridge. Uh, there has to be someone who fills the gap. There has to be someone who connects sin to the Father. And the only person who can connect uh, sin uh, to the Father is Jesus Christ. The only person who can connect the sin nature of man to the Father is Jesus Christ. The only one who can connect man to the Father is Jesus Christ. Now, earlier I said the only one who could connect sin. I'm not talking about living in that sin. But man is born into sin. And man has a nature of sin. And sin separates man from God. And so the only one to reconcile man to God is Jesus Christ. So here we've got it. I mean, he signifies his grace. It is by him. The Bible says we are saved by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so upon the cross of Calvary, You've got the blood of his cross. It signifies his Godhead, but it also signifies his grace. The Bible says, by him. Now, let me tell you the difference between uh, that little phrase, by him, to reconcile, and, 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 and the doctrine of those that teach a works-based salvation. You see, we believe, and we know without a doubt, that we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Paul said it's not of works. Man cannot act good enough to receive the grace of God. Man cannot do enough works to receive the grace of God. It is an act of God. Yes, 
man has a decision to make. Yes, man has a choice to make. But salvation does not come just by the decision you or I one would make. It comes by the fact that Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary and the Bible says the blood, the blood of his cross, which signifies his grace by him, it is an act of God. But now listen to me. You must respond. That's why Jesus said, Come unto me. Come and see. Come. You have to respond. And it's important for you to remember this. And this is a gospel truth. The Bible is so clear to teach us that by him to reconcile, it is only by the grace of God that you can be brought from here to here. I love some of the tracks that we use. They just thrill my heart. Because if you'll notice, they always have, over on this side would be man or sin. And then there's a great guff in between. And it looks like a valley here. And then in that valley, it will have the cross. And it will be as if man can move from this point to God, to the Savior, to Jesus, to salvation. And he crosses only by one way, by the cross and it was the blood of his cross and so the bible says very clearly to me and by him to reconcile it is by his grace it is by him now think about it you have the sovereign god in the godhead now you have the saving power of the lord jesus christ in his grace when he says in him by him. In other words, the only person who can save you is Jesus. Now, I want to pause for just a moment. I want to talk to you about that just very brief, briefly. I know that that's not the way of the world. I'm looking into the camera now, and I, I want you to hear me, and I'm looking into your eyes and faces, and I want you to listen to me closely. I know the world teaches that there are many ways to the Father that is a subtle lie straight from the pits of hell. There is only one mediator between man and God. His name is Christ Jesus. There's only one way of salvation. Neither is there any other name given among men whereby men can be saved except by the name of Jesus Christ. So the only way of salvation is in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. The only way to be reconciled, to be linked from man to God is in a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so it's vital for you to understand that the blood of his cross signifies his grace. In him, by him. God lavished upon us his unmerited favor that even though we are sinners, Jesus Christ died in our stead. Jesus died in our place. And the only way to be a believer and the only way to be reconciled and linked to God is by his grace, by him. He is the only person who can save you from your sin. Now, to me, the blood of his cross not only signifies his Godhead in him, not only signifies his grace by him, that of salvation, but it also signifies his gift you say, what do you mean? Well, let me read the rest of that verse. Let me quote it for you. It says, and by him, now listen to this, to reconcile all things to himself. To himself. So we move from in him, by him, to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, that they, listen, having made peace through the blood of his cross. So, we move from in him, by him, now to himself. How is a man drawn unto the Lord Jesus Christ? I'm telling you how. It is a gift of God. Here's what the Bible says in Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, look at that passage of Scripture again. Notice how he quotes it. 
He says, For it pleased the Father that in him is all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things, listen to this, to himself. It is the gift of God. Wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is what? Eternal life through whom? Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, I love this passage. For in this passage signifies unto us a gift that Tommy Fountain can be drawn to himself. Who himself? Not me, none of them. Himself with the cowboy, to Jesus. That is a gift of God. Only the Lord Jesus can do that. See, the only way a man or a woman or a boy or girl can have true peace in their life is that we're drawn to the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we are drawn to Him by the working of the Holy Spirit of God, then we can receive His gift. It is a gift that we must receive, that we must accept. Somebody talked the other day about a difference between receiving and accepting. I, I think it's semantics. I don't make a big deal out of it. As a matter of fact, I like to use the term, we surrender to the Lord. Uh, we used to talk about how that we commit ourselves to the Lord. Uh, how that uh, we, we yield our lives to the Lord. But, but it's the point is, is that Jesus Christ, what he did in shedding his blood on the cross of Calvary, the blood of his cross that Jesus Christ shed on the cross of Calvary out of his own body. was so that you and I could receive the gift of God. And we could know Him as our personal Lord and Savior. And so that's what it signifies to me. When I looked at that passage of Scripture, I'd never seen it quite like that. And you say, Brother Tommy, how do you see it? Well, pretty easy. For if you look at that text again, you can see how that there's the fullness of the Godhead, there's the fullness of Him, that He is in Him. He is Christ. Listen. The perfect, sinless Lamb of God, Jesus, hangs upon the cross of Calvary 2,000 plus years ago in all the fullness of the Godhead. The perfect, sinless Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, hangs upon the cross of Calvary, shedding His blood to signify His grace that by Him, we can be saved. What he did for us on the cross, God's riches at Christ's expense, his unmerited favor, he shed his blood for us. And Jesus Christ, the perfect, sinless Lamb of God, his blood upon the cross signifies his gift to each of us. He says that I can draw you to himself whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. By him, by him, in him, to himself, that we might be saved. Now think about that with me. Ponder it. Think about Jesus on the cross of Calvary. Just recalling the first thing he said on the cross of Calvary as his body was covered with the blood and the blood that was on his cross. He looked out and he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And secondly, one thief railed him. Another thief cried out and said, Remember me when you come into the paradise. And Jesus said, Son, I'll remember you. Now I'm paraphrasing that. But it's very important to remember what Jesus said when he said, Today you will be with me in paradise. Have you ever thought about it? There upon the cross he offered forgiveness to the world. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Upon the cross that was covered with his blood, he said, Verily, verily, truly, truly, today you will be with me in paradise. And then he looked out there and all the disciples had run, but one who was more than likely John the Beloved and Mary the mother of Jesus. And you remember what Jesus said? 
That third saying where he looked out and said, Woman, behold thy son. And I believe he looked at the beloved John and said, John, take care of my mother. Behold thy mother. But his darkness came upon the face of the earth. Do you remember what the Lord Jesus cried out? Upon the cross when he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And do you remember what he said next? As the hours moved on, and darkness had covered over the face of the earth, he cried out and said, It is finished. It is complete. It is done. Prior to that, that was a sick saying, but I missed one. He said, I thirst. I thirst. And the Bible says they took upon a reed and vinegar was on that and they put it to his mouth and to his lips. Ah, he wasn't the only one who was thirsty that day. Certainly the Lamb of God was thirsty, but there were those who were standing all around looking and watching, and they were thirsty. He had a natural physical thirst. Imagine the lips were parched, but they had more than a natural physical thirst. They had a spiritual thirst. Can you see it now? As Jesus cries out and says, I thirst. He's probably taken all the way back to the Gospel of John chapter 4 when there was a woman at the well who wasn't a godly woman, who was an adulterous woman. And Jesus reached out to her and told her that he would give her water where she would never, ever thirst again. And I'm telling you, the blood of his cross, the Lord Jesus Christ, was bearing for you and for me upon the cross of Calvary, even though he literally thirsted. There's a world out there right now who is hungering, who's thirsting, who's thirsting for righteousness, who's thirsting for answers, who's thirsting for godliness. And they're looking and searching in all the wrong places. But I want to tell you, let's point them to the cross, the blood of his cross. Yeah, and then he said, it is finished. And I believe the last words of the Lord Jesus were, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And the Bible says, he died. Now upon him that day was a lot of suffering. Upon him that day was your sin and my sin. But yet upon the Lord Jesus Christ, on that day was salvation for all of mankind. Let me just point you back to the text. Let me point you back to the text one more time. For it pleased the Father that in Him all the fullness should dwell. And by him, in him, by him, to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth, things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. The sovereign God, as the Savior of the world, died so that sinners could be saved and could become saints. Today,
Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Here's what some of you are saying. Well, I'm, I'm too bad to give my heart to Jesus. Some of you are saying, well, I'm all right. So you're saying, I'm too good to give my heart to Jesus. Let me give you an example or two examples of a man who was too bad and a man who was too good to give their life to Jesus. If my family is listening, I want to talk to those two for just, I want to talk about those two for a moment. The one that was too bad to give his heart and life to Jesus was my daddy. My daddy, at the age of 36, was a drug addict and an alcoholic. Our life was completely dysfunctional. It was awful. And and that's all I'm going to say about that. My daddy was just a, a bad man. He was not a good man. But in the summer of 1969, my dad accepted Christ as his Lord and Savior. He yielded his life to Christ. He received the joy of salvation. And Jesus Christ came to live in his heart. He was a bad man, but he got saved, gloriously saved. And his brother, my Uncle Hube, he was 60 plus years old. He was a good man. He provided well for his family. He did a lot of good things, had a great job, had a beautiful yard, had a beautiful family, and had a real nice, beautiful home. He was a good man, but he had never received Jesus as Lord and Savior. But at the age of 60 plus, he came to a realization that being a good man was not enough, that he needed a Savior, that he needed one, that he needed to know the grace of God. He needed to receive the gift of God. And so my Uncle Hugh, with David Howe, former pastor at Edgewood Baptist Church, one evening, being a good man, prayed and asked Jesus into his life. Listen to me, and I need to go. You can't be too bad. Jesus still loves you. Whether you're 30 years, you could have done the worst things in the whole wide world. And Jesus Christ still died on the cross for your sin, and he loves you. It is in him, by him, that he will draw you to himself. He desires to reconcile you, no matter how bad you are. You can be in the throes of sin. You can be living in a dark, deep dungeon. You can be a drug addict. You can be an alcoholic. You can be a perverted person. You can be in jail. You could be a thief. You can be a murderer. It doesn't matter how bad you are. Jesus Christ will save you. All you got to do is come to him. Come to Jesus. Oh, but wait a minute, Brother Tommy. I'm not like that. You can be a good man, just like my uncle. But I'll never forget, right after he got saved, and he'd been saved a few months, and I went by his house, and I'll never forget what he said to me. He said, son, I wish that I'd received Jesus a lot sooner. But he was a good man. You can be a good man. You can provide well for your family. You can have all the wealth and the riches. You can even be a religious person. But if you've never had a relationship with Jesus Christ, you too, good man, can receive Jesus. I've preached much longer than I anticipated or I thought that I would be preaching this morning. But I want you to hear me. It is the blood of his cross that Jesus Christ went to his cross So that you and I could be saved. Here's how you can be saved today. Right where you are, sitting there in your home, sitting in a car, sitting outside, wherever you might be, you can ask Jesus Christ to come live in your heart. No matter how bad you are, no matter how good you are, no matter how middle of the road you are, everybody needs Jesus. And today, you can ask him. You could pray a prayer like this. Just look at me and listen to me. And you can pray it in your own words, but you can say, Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, that you died for my sin. Upon a cruel cross, you shed your blood for me. I ask you now to forgive me. 
I turn from my sin. I ask you to come live in my heart. Would you ask him today to come live in your heart? Ask him. He will save you. If you've done that, I would like for you just to put a little note under this broadcast or you can send something to us to one of our Facebook pages. Say, I received Christ today. I accepted Christ as my Savior. Or you can call me. Here's my number. 678-928-1574. 678-928-1574. And you can give your heart and your life to Jesus Christ. I want you to let us know. Let us know today that you have received Jesus. Father, thank you that you shed your blood on the cross of Calvary so that we might be reconciled to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.